Henry Andrews Cotton was born in 1876 on May the 18th. He was an American psychiatrist and the medical director at the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum. American psychiatrist Henry Cotton had a delusional insanity theory. He was convinced that insanity resulted from untreated infections in the body. One of the most common forms of infection occurred in the mouth and teeth and therefore he believed that removing the teeth of mentally ill patients could cure them. It was this belief that left hundreds of patients dead and thousands maimed for life. He and his staff practiced experimental surgery, bacteriology on patients, the extraction of potentially diseased parts of the head and body. He would therefore remove all of some of the patient's teeth their tonsils and frequently spleens, colons, ovaries and other organs. These practices continued long after the statistics showed that the extraordinarily high cure rates that Cotton suggested were actually false and did in fact reveal that the opposite was true and that the very high mortality and morbidity as a result of these aggressive inhumane treatments Although Cotton forced obvious trauma against his victims, frequently against their will, he did implement some progressive ideas for patient care that would shape the medical future, such as abolishing mechanical restraints and implementing meetings of daily staff to discuss outpatient care. During his 26-year reign of terror at the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, Dr. Henry Cotton performed over 645 twisted operations in which he tried to save the mentally ill. Henry Cotton became the medical doctor and superintendent of the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital in 1907. He wasted no time in proposing and carrying out his mad procedures that were to save many mental patients. As soon as Cotton was promoted to the medical director at the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, he began his wacky and delusional treatments on his patients and started to remove their infected teeth to cure them of their madness. This was long before people were aware of heroin addictions of which were likely the cause of many of his patients' ill health. Cotton was often surprised that his treatment did not always cure them of their madness. It just stopped them from being able to speak and eat properly. Cotton was still convinced that infection was the root cause of mental illness and therefore would assume that the infection had spread further from the mouth to other areas of the body. He would then go on to remove other areas of the body that he believed could have become infected. And these include tonsils, stomachs, gallbladders, testicles, ovaries and more. This would leave his patients permanently harmed with problems with fertility, digestion and, ironically, higher risks of infection from the surgery. Other doctors were becoming impressed, both locally and internationally, as Cotton had falsified his statistics that he had cured 85% of his patients. Although he included in that figure those who had died under his care, as having benefited since they were no longer suffering from the mental difficulties. His method looked to be working in curing patients of their ill health and his colleagues were eager to embrace his methods and he had created a best practice for other professionals to follow. Cotton was now a famous man, acknowledged both in America and Europe for his radical but supposedly successful treatment of insanity. Parents of children thought to be mentally unstable, those that could not be managed by the community or local institutions, were anxious to book for treatment with Cotton, who was becoming increasingly busy. When the children could not get into Dr Cotton's surgery, they would request that their local doctor copy his surgeries. His new theory had become even more radical. He thought it was a good idea to carry out colostomies on children, and this involved removing part or all of the large bowel. He believed this would reduce the likelihood of these children developing a mental illness in the future, as well as stopping bad habits such as masturbation. As Henry Cotton continued to perform his bizarre surgeries, his patient's death rate was rising, and at one point, one in three patients died after undergoing Cotton's treatment. 
Unfortunately, this was before antibiotics, so many of his patients died on the operating table. He blamed the deaths on their already poor physical condition, of which he often inflicted by removing more and more of their body parts and organs with each surgery. Many patients of the mental institution recognised the danger of cotton surgeries when their friends did not return from them. They would refuse to the surgery and were therefore dragged, resisting and screaming. The rights of the mentally ill were not particularly protected and therefore thousands of patients suffered trauma that they could not protect themselves from and they were often too vulnerable to advocate for themselves. One particular fortunate patient underwent a gastroenterostomy, followed by a right side colectomy. When she remained depressed, she then received successfully a thyroidectomy, a complete colectomy, removal of both ovaries and fallopian tubes, removal of her cervix, three series of vaccine treatments and two series of serum treatments, following which she was discharged as recovered. Some psychiatrists were becoming increasingly concerned and sceptical of cotton surgeries, and allegations were servicing of mistreatment of patients. When doubted, he would make strange changes to his processes, and once replaced all his male nurses with female ones, and thus escaped criticism. In 1910, the New York Times wrote that men naturally are too rough with patients, and that male patients are not so excited by the approach of women nurses. Cotton believes the presence of women nurses is restful to the diseased mind. Seventeen years into his reign of terror, an investigation was initiated by Dr Phyllis Greenacre, a former student of Mayer. Greenacre had a hunch that despite positive falsified reports of success, that these treatments could not be working. During her investigation, she visited the asylum and found the hospital environment damaging to the mental well-being of its patients, and she said cotton was singularly peculiar. During her investigation, she found that staff records were chaotic, and cotton's data was contradictory, which confirmed her hunch was correct. She was often disturbed by the patients, as well as cotton, mostly because none of them had any teeth. Determined to get to the bottom of the case, Greenacre investigated 62 patients that had been victims of Cotton's delusional surgeries. She shockingly discovered that 17 patients had died right after Cotton's surgeries, while several others suffered for a few months before finally dying. Other findings showed that only five patients recovered completely, while three improved, but she had symptoms. The remaining patients were unimproved and when the records of 645 patients who had undergone cotton surgery were examined and compared to 407 who had not undergone surgeries, it was found that the recovery rate was actually higher among those patients who had not been treated by him. During the investigations, Cotton suddenly went conveniently mad. However, after time, Greenacre's damning report was ignored and buried while the New Jersey State Senate lost all interest in the asylum, leading to Cotton miraculously recovering. Apparently, his madness was caused by a few infected teeth, and once he removed them, he felt much better. So he also removed his wife's teeth, as well as the teeth of his two children. Immediately, Cotton's mad treatments were back in demand. Not only did Cotton continue his surgical procedures in Trenton, and travelled around US and Europe giving lectures. He also opened a private clinic where he welcomed wealthy patients, desperate to have their loved ones cured of madness. In the 1930s, Cotton had retired and became medical director. However, that didn't stop him concocting a new idea. Naturally, Henry Cotton and his supporters fought fiercely against the allegations that their surgical procedures were harmful and people did believe that he was trying to help his patients, and he truly believed in them, so much so that he carried them out on himself and his two sons. However, to the shock of all, in the middle of his latest fight, Cotton died of a heart attack in 1933, and mental patients at Trenton could finally breathe more easily. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories, and leave your suggestions below, and I will endeavour to cover them.